Good morning, everybody. As Reginald said, my name is Mark Somer, and I'm excited to be here with you this morning. Uh, and the reason why I'm excited is because I get to talk about my favorite subject, Jesus Christ. Now, can I ask you, what emotions stir in you when you hear the name Jesus Christ? Love him, hate him, be confused by him, or be drawn to him, everybody has a reaction to Jesus Christ. There's an old song that says, Jesus, there's just something about that name. And it's true. Ambivalence is not an option our Lord has given us concerning himself. I could name some of the greatest and most influential people of all time, Thomas Jefferson, Joan of Arc, Louise Pasteur, and it might be possible for you to be unemotional when hearing those great people. But there's something about Jesus Christ. He does not allow us to be without a reaction. Growing up, for me, I had a reaction to the name of Jesus Christ. I hated Jesus Christ. You see, I am a Jew. I was raised a Jew in a Jewish home by proud Jewish Parents, even as a small child, I knew that Hitler wanted to kill every Jew. I also knew that as a Jew, number one, my duty above all else was to remain a Jew. I was also taught about Gentiles. Actually, they were called Goyim. I won't call you Goyim because that's not a very nice term. Um, but it was quite understood that I was not one of them. There was us and there was them. I am a Jew, and being Jewish has always been a privilege and a joy for me. Even as a child, I loved memorizing prayers in Hebrew and reciting them to my parents. They often told me that I filled them with so much nachas. Uh, nachas is the Yiddish way of, of saying pride and joy. Uh, and it actually, Skip, you could probably say nachas pretty well, because when you feel sick, you can, ha, ha, you, know, you can do those Jewish Yiddish words r real well. So uh, now, like, like all good Jewish boys, at age 13, I had a bar mitzvah, uh, which is an important milestone in the Jewish uh, religion. I prayed. I went to shul, which is the Jewish way of saying synagogue. In fact, when I was in high school, a time when most people, uh, most of my peers had turned away from attending synagogue, I voluntarily went to shul every Sabbath. I was religious. Now, by, by the time I was a young adult, about 18 years old, and no, that wasn't just a few years ago. Um, <laughs> by the time when I, the time I was a young adult, about 18, I, I knew a lot about the rituals I did for this God of mine. I knew a lot about memorizing prayers in Hebrew and about going to Shul. I knew about Rosh Hashanah and the Day of Atonement. I certainly knew about the Holocaust. I was religious, but I didn't know anything about who God was. I certainly didn't know what God wanted from me, if anything. And despite going to show every week, it didn't really cross my mind what God wanted from me. It never really occurred to me when I made decisions. I wonder what God thinks about this. Did you know that it is possible to go through the motions of religion without even knowing what you're doing or why you're doing it? Some of the most devout people in the whole world from any religion have no idea why they do the rituals that they do. Let me explain it this way. Every day I drive about 45 minutes from my home to my workplace. Five days per week, 50 weeks per year, makes you very familiar with the commute. I am familiar with the road. I know where my turns are. I know where my exit is. Sometimes when I'm done with my commute, I get to work, I pull in the parking lot. It's, it's like I don't even remember driving. It's as if my, my body just mindlessly went through the motions. Have you ever had that experience? Just <laughs> That's right, just, just mindlessly going through the motions. Well, I'm here to tell you that my religious life was a life of mindlessly going through the motions. You go to shul, you stand up, and the rabbi says, stand up, you sit down, you say the mika mocha, and, you know, and, and amen. And that's it, just motions, rules and religion with no relationship with God. So why am I here this morning? I'm here because the creator of the universe broke through the motions and revealed himself to me. You see, there's one thing that every good Jewish kid knows, and that is this. We are Jews, and Jews do not 
believe in Jesus. Whoever this Christ was, he's not for us, not for my people. If our Goyim neighbors wanted to believe in Jesus, that's fine for us. But don't try to tell us about him because good Jews are not interested in Jesus. You want to make a Jew angry? Tell him about Jesus. You want to make a Jew really angry? Tell him about other Jews who believe in Jesus. Weirdos, freaks. My parents had told me about Jewish people who gave up their Jewishness, turned their backs on our people, and why? For a figment of their imagination known as the carpenter from Galilee. I, like, like most Jews, were taught that to be a Jew who believes in Jesus is to turn your back on your family, on your people. So what a terrible thing. Like many Jews as a kid, I was called a Christ killer by my Gentile peers. What a horrible thing to be accused of. My rabbi and my parents taught me that that was yet another example of anti-Semitism. Us Jews, we had to stick together. And by the time I had become an adult, I had an opinion of Jesus. I hated Jesus Christ, and I was angry when I heard his name. I doubt you've ever met anyone as angry with Jesus as I was when I was in college. As a junior, I was entrusted with taking care of a group of incoming freshmen at the beginning of the school year. I was taking them to the dining hall, showing them how to get there, how to use their dining card, and that was my job to get them acclimated on campus. And there was a Christian student group outside the dining hall passing out literature. Now, mind you, they were allowed to do this. They were a recognized student group. They had permission from the university to be there and hand out their flyers. But I became so enraged that I got in the face of the leader of the group and made such a scene that they left, even though they were allowed to be there. I was angry at Jesus. Now, in contrast, I might have been angry at Jesus, but I was very happy with me. And why wouldn't I be? By the world standards, I was doing quite well. I had good grades, I had a good job, I had good friends, and I was comfortable with my beliefs. Now, lo not long after the scene that I made with that Christian group, one of the freshmen asked me if I had ever read any part of the New Testament. And my answer was, that's not for Jews to read. But he did something clever. He questioned my intellectualism. He said, you call yourself smart? and you haven't even read the New Testament? How could you not know about the most influential book ever written? And with that, he touched a nerve. You see, one of the things I liked most about myself was that I was an intellectual, so full of pride. I liked the fact that I knew about a lot of different things. If you wanted to talk about computers, I could do that. If you wanted to talk about music or art, I was well-versed. I enjoyed discussing Shakespeare and Plato and other classics. I liked being an intellectual, and I didn't like that this freshman of all people pointed out that I didn't know anything about the most influential book ever written. But I knew he was right. The New Testament was talked about in my literature classes, but I didn't know anything about the New Testament. I was taught that Jews don't read the New Testament. But what nobody told me, get this, it was Jews who wrote the New Testament. But no one ever told me that. So with the intention of showing this freshman how ridiculous he was for believing in the Bible, I picked up a Bible and I started to read. I flipped past Psalms, past Proverbs, past some books with names I had never heard of. Names like Haggai and Nahum and Zechariah. And after I flipped past Malachi, I found a very frightening page. You know the one. It says the beginning of the New Testament. I remember being outside my dorm room uh, and looking around to make sure no one was looking. <laughs> and then I did it. I flipped over the page and read Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. The first verse in the New Testament says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Such chilling words. You have to understand that as a Jew, I thought the roots of anti-Semitism were to be found in the New Testament. If not there, then certainly the New Testament must support such things. Everybody has an opinion about Jesus, and mine was anger. Jesus wasn't for me. He was for them, not for me. But I knew that if I wanted to continue to consider myself an intellectual, 
then I had to read it. I expected to find anti-Semitism. I expected the stuff that inspired Hitler. But I found neither. Instead, I found Jesus. And to my shock, he was so Jewish. He quoted Hebrew scripture, some of the same passages I had memorized as a kid in Shoal. And he said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15, 24. This was not what I expected. Blew my mind. So what was I to make of this? Well, I was an intellectual, so I thought it over. That's what intellectuals do. And I asked everybody I knew what their opinion of Jesus was. I asked the guys who lived in the dorm with me what they thought of Jesus. I asked people at the dining hall what they thought of Jesus. I asked people I work with what they thought of Jesus. I asked girls I was trying to flirt with, what do you think of Jesus? You know, I, you know, <laughs> I was witnessing to people, and I wasn't even saved yet. <laughs> um, but I couldn't get it out of my mind. So I thought about it, and I discovered that though I was very religious and did outward rituals for God, I had no relationship with God. In fact, Jesus himself warned against this very thing in Matthew 15, 7 through 9. He said, you hypocrites, very harsh. He said, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They honor with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. That was me. I worship God with my lips, but I was following rules passed down from rabbis and even rules I had made up myself. I had no standard from God. I wasn't following God's word. Please note that Jesus was quoting Isaiah, one of the most revered Jewish prophets. And Isaiah, 3,000 years ago, was describing me. Though I did rituals, my heart was far from God. Now, like most people, I spent more time and energy planning my weekend than I did thinking about the creator of the universe. Sure, I went to temple on the high holidays, and I believed in some sort of spiritual higher power or something or other. But in practice, I wasn't interested in what God had to say. God certainly didn't have an influence on my day-to-day -day activities, the choices I made. Like the Bible says, my heart was far from God. Now, I made it to the Gospel of John, also written by a Jew, and I read where Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he said, do you believe this? That's John 11, 25, 26. And there was something about that that was so clear to me. Believe in Jesus and live or reject him and die. And from reading Matthew and John, I knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. He was talking about hell. Now, have you ever read a book or watched a movie, but you don't really care how it ends because you're not too emotionally invested? You know, if you fall asleep and you miss the ending, eh, it's not a big deal. Eh, whatever. Well, my experience reading Jesus' words were the exact radical opposite of that. Jesus was saying, I am the resurrection, believe in me and enter the kingdom of heaven or reject me and go to hell. There was no room for ambivalence. You see, it no, matter, it no longer mattered what my neighbors saw, not even what my parents saw. It doesn't matter what my rabbis saw. It didn't matter. What mattered was that Jesus drew a line in the sand and said, I have the resurrection and the way to heaven. See, I had thought that Jesus was just for Gentiles, but I, I started reading the Bible, and I learned that just about everyone who believed in him at first were Jews. I found out that Jesus was Jewish, that he was interested in the Torah, and that he is our Messiah. For the first time in my life, it became clear to me that I was, I was a sinner. This person, I liked myself so much, I thought I was so great. I'm not so great. I'm a sinner, and I deserve to go to hell. I deserved it, and I knew that Jesus Christ was the only sacrifice for sins acceptable to God. And if I repent of my sins and put my faith in Christ, get this, he'll forgive me 
man, I didn't even forgive my friends for petty things that they did. And yet Jesus Christ was willing to forgive me for living a rebellious life against God. What a great, merciful God we serve. Now, I didn't know a whole lot that day when I, got, when I received Christ. There were many books in the Bible I had never, writ, uh, never studied yet. But I knew that I knew God. And I knew that God knew me. And when I thought about the name of Jesus, I didn't have anger anymore. I had thankfulness. You see, you can't get angry with the man who saves you from spending eternity in hell and makes you right with God. I began studying the Hebrew Bible, and I learned that we are accountable to God, just like a criminal is accountable to the criminal justice system. We have all broken God's law, and we stand guilty before the judge. There is coming a day when God will judge us all based on the intents of our hearts. There will be no appeals, no technicalities, no evidence thrown out if we defend ourselves based on our own actions, we will be condemned to hell forever. But our loving God is about hope. So just as he provided a sacrifice for Abraham in Isaac's place, so he provided a sacrifice for us in our place. Atonement means that God will pass over our sins and punish someone else in our place. That someone else is Jesus Christ. The Hebrew Bible says that Messiah, quote, was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people, Isaiah 53, 8. It says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, verse 5. This is all found in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. This isn't in some Christian tract. This was written a thousand years before Jesus even came to earth. In fact, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, the Hebrew Bible predicted that the Messiah's hands and feet would be pierced. It says the Messiah would be killed for his people. If that's not supernatural proof of the Bible, then I don't know what is. If you're Jewish, then know that God provided Messiah Jesus as an offering for you. If you're a Gentile, well, you're invited too. Because God promised Abraham in Genesis 22, 18, that through his seed he'd bless all the nations of the earth. Jesus is for Jews and Gentiles. The Old and New Testaments agree that both Jews and Gentiles need Jesus Christ. Our hearts are far from God, so we need atonement. It's actually very simple. It's actually very Jewish. God calls us to return to him. Though every one of us has a heart that is far from God through our sin, because of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, we can return to God. God says in the Haftarah, which are the prophetic books of the Old Testament, he says, quote, I will give them, us, a heart to know that I am the Lord, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. That's Jeremiah 24, 7. Now, the tough thing about this is that as Jews, we can think that believing in Jesus somehow makes us un-Jewish. Isn't it a strange contradiction that nobody questions if a fellow Jew claims to be an atheist or an agnostic or a Buddhist, but if you're a Jew and you claim to believe in the Messiah exactly as outlined in the Hebrew Bible, whoa, man, then, you know, fireworks go off and nobody knows what to do. Um, But the message is this. We owe a sin debt to God, and Jesus paid the debt in full. Now, remember that you guys know the Passover story. And when God told the Israelites to slaughter a lamb and, and, and put the lamb's blood over the doorposts of, of, your, of your home, and then God's wrath would pass over you. Well, see, that is a perfect picture of exactly what Jesus did, the Messiah's death. It, it's our only hope is to ask God to apply the blood of Jesus, not to the doorposts of our homes, but to the doorposts of our heart. And so that on the day of judgment, God's wrath will pass over us. And we put the the lamb's blood, Jesus' blood, over our hearts through faith and repentance. Repent of your sins, put your faith in Christ, and the blood of Jesus Christ will cover you on the day of judgment. That is God's promise from his word. And if that weren't wonderful enough, God promised through the Jewish prophet Jeremiah to give us a new heart 
with new desires, a heart that is not far from God, a heart that beats spiritually, that wants to please God and do uh, things that, that, that please God and, and honor him. By God's power, by the Holy Spirit, we can return to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And he will give us a new heart filled with the Holy Spirit so we can live a life pleasing to him. And if that's not reason enough to say hallelujah, then I don't know what is. Hallelujah to that. Now, the truth is that many Jews and many Gentiles have received Jesus as Messiah. Since I received Jesus Christ as Messiah and began following him, I've never believed that I've become un-Jewish. I haven't become a Gentile. I'm not a goyim. <laughs> when a black person follows Jesus, they don't become unblack. When a Chinese person follows Jesus, they don't become un-Chinese. And when a Jew follows Jesus, they don't become a Gentile. When a Jew follows Jesus, they become more Jewish. What could be more Jewish than believing in the Jewish Messiah? Okay, enough about a Jewish kid who believes in Jesus. Let's talk about you. Um, I have a test for you, quick test. What do the following people have in common? Abraham Lincoln, Marie Curie, Muhammad, Albert Einstein, Mozart, and Aristotle. Wealth, intelligence, influence. Here's the answer. What each of them have in common is that they're all dead. The reality of the situation is that 10 out of 10 people die. It is the ultimate statistic. No one is exempt. And have you noticed that even though Every human being dies. Many of us are uncomfortable even thinking about it. We live in a culture that is gripped with how we look on the outside. Diet books are bestsellers, and magazines like Vogue and GQ are wildly successful. In fact, one of the first things most people do in the morning after they get out of bed is to look in the mirror, right? Now, how do you look first thing in the morning when you get out of bed? <laughs> your hair's out of place. Your pupils need adjusting. Often your face needs a good wash. And we do these things gladly before leaving the bathroom because we want to look good on the outside, don't we? We want to be presentable. We don't want to come here all dirty and smelly and hair like a rooster. Um, but have you considered that what is much more important than how you look on the outside is how you look on the inside? Now you might ask, how do we know what we look like on the inside? And the answer is the same way you look on the outside. You look in the mirror, but not the mirror in your home or in your apartment, but you look in the mirror of God's law, the Ten Commandments. God has given us the Ten Commandments to show us what we look like on the inside. And I warn you, it's not that pretty. Most of us want to be presentable to other people, but it is much more important to be presentable to God. So let's take a minute, if you would, to look in the mirror together. The ninth commandment says, thou shalt not lie. Now, please ask yourself honestly, have you ever told a lie? <laughs> of course. Everyone said something wasn't true at one point or another. Now, what do we call someone who tells lies? A li exactly. We call them a liar. Now, here's the hard part. If you've told lies and we call people who tell lies liars, what does that make you? If we listen to our conscience, we must admit that we're liars. The Eighth Commandment says you shall not steal. So please ask yourself, have you ever taken anything that didn't belong to you? A pen, a paper clip, creative tax preparation, maybe a song or a movie off the internet that you didn't pay for? How about time away from an employer by goofing off? The val See, God's not impressed with the value of what we steal. If we've taken anything that doesn't belong to us, we are a thief. The third commandment says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Have you ever used God's name as a swear word? When we hit our hand with a hammer, we don't yell, Oh, Hitler! Oh, Osama! What do we yell? We yell, Jesus Christ, or God. And sometimes we add a profanity at the end of it, don't we? Um, God's name deserves to be revered and considered holy. 
and lifted high, but instead we take the name of the one who made us, the one who breathed life into our body, and we use it to express disgust and anger. And when we do that, we take God's name and we make it lower than Osama bin Laden's name. The technical word for that is blasphemy. And it is a very serious sin in God's sight. The Bible says the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Exodus 20, verse 7. It's all in the Old Testament, folks. The seventh commandment says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, many people say at this point, aha, you got, uh -huh, I'm off. I've never done that. I've never committed adultery. But Jesus said, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent, who has has already committed adultery with her in their heart. Matthew 5, 28. Now, who of us can honestly say we've never lusted ever? If we are honest with ourselves and we listen to our conscience, and I beg you to do that this morning, we all must admit that we are lying, thieving, blasphemous, adulterers at heart. And the Bible warns us that God has fixed a, quote, fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness, Acts 17.31. And we've only looked at four of the Ten Commandments. There are six more. Now, perhaps you might be saying, but I haven't broken all of those commandments. Well, consider if I put a large mirror here, and I wrote all Ten Commandments on the mirror, and I gave you a hammer, and I challenged you to hit the mirror in such a way that you only crack one of the commandments but none of the other ones. Could you do that? No, of course not. If you hit the mirror, it, the whole thing's going to shatter. And in the same way, uh, the Bible says, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. That's James 2.10. Think of it this way. A man is found guilty of rape and murder. It would do no good to say to the judge, judge, I admit it, I'm guilty of rape and murder, but I just want you to know, I've never robbed anybody in my life. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't make any difference. Break one law, and you are a lawbreaker. If we've broken even one of God's laws, we are guilty before God with no defense. You see, we are not as good as we think we are. Ask yourself, and listen to your conscience, please, if God were to judge you based on his perfect Ten Commandments, and he will, would you be found innocent or guilty? There is no more important question than that. So I'll say it again. If God were to judge you based on his perfect standard, would you be found innocent or guilty? Ten out of ten people die. 155,000 people died yesterday. 155,000 people will die today. And many of those people did not think that their time was up. Not everybody dies in a, at the late stages of a cancer ward. Many people who die are young, healthy. 155,000 people every day. 10 out of 10 people die. And the Bible warns us, quote, in the book of Hebrews, it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, Hebrews 9.27. The sad fact is most of us spend more time planning our vacations than we do thinking about where we'll spend eternity. If you were, got, if you were gonna go to France next year, you would look it up. You would buy a book on France. You would learn the language. You would go on the internet. You would find out what hotels to go to, what restaurants to go to. Do you spend that much time thinking about what's going to happen when you die? We've already established that God sees us as lying, thieving, blasphemous, adulterers at heart. We've all broken his perfect commandments. If God were to judge us based on his commandments, we would, deserve, would we deserve to go to heaven or to hell? Please be honest. And you don't even have to think about it because the Bible tells you the answer. It says in Revelation 21, 8, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. It also says the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. This should concern us greatly. I am concerned about the bailout in Greece. I am concerned about my 401k. I am concerned about will I be able to raise my children the way I want to. 
but nothing should concern me or you more than where are we going to go when we die. If there's even a chance in a million that this is true, please consider it. On the day of judgment, God will judge not only our actions, but our thoughts as well. The Bible warns us, quote, God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, the secret things, whether good or evil. That was uh, King Solomon who wrote that in Ecclesiastes 12, 14, even the secret things. Jesus said, I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment, Matthew 12, 36. Every idle word? Ugh. How many idle words do you say that you wish you could take back? Now imagine, we are talking about technology earlier. Imagine if we could put a microchip on the back of your ear and it would record every thought that you had for one week. Just one week. And at the end of the week, we'd pull the chip out, we'd attach it to a computer, and uh, all your thoughts would be projected on a screen at a local movie theater. <laughs> and there in the audience is your spouse, uh, your mom, your children, your boss, your friends, all of your hidden, secret, disgusting thoughts would be laid bare for all to see for just one week of your life. Now, if we're honest, I'll be honest, the thought of that, I would go running, screaming like a madman and get a one-way ticket to Timbuktu. The horror and the shame of just one week's of our thoughts I'm here to tell you that God sees our thoughts. He sees your lust and considers it adultery. He sees your hatred and considers it murder. He knows when you're unthankful and blasphemous and self-centered. And he says that he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness and all secret things will be laid bare. Now we can be like the child who covers his eyes and shakes his head, hoping that will prevent him from having to take a bath or we could bury our head like an ostrich, but it will do us no good. Jesus has drawn a line in the sand. You can reject this or you can believe it, but you cannot be ambivalent about it. God is angry at sin, and we have already established that God sees us as lying, thieving, blasphemous, adulterers at heart. If God is just, he must punish lawbreakers. If he didn't be, he, God would be unrighteous. The Bible warns us it is pointed for man to die once, and after this comes judgment, Hebrew 9, 27. We are not nearly as good as we think we are. So please, I beg you, please look in the mirror of God's perfect commandments and see how short we have all fallen. None of us are good when we measure ourselves the way God measures us. We may be good if we measure ourselves against our neighbor or against some celebrity, but that's not how God measures us. He measures us against himself. His word is, is, is him. It's a, it's a reflection of his being, of who he is. And we will not be judged based on the neighbor you don't like. We will be judged based on God's perfect standards. The Bible is very clear when it says there is none righteous. No, not one. Romans 3.10. Now, I came here this morning because I don't want you to go to hell. And you don't want to go there either. It's an awful place that Jesus described as a lake of fire where there is torment and weeping and gnashing of teeth, where the worm never dies and where there is complete darkness. Some people say, well, I want to go to hell to be, to be with my friends. You ever heard, you ever talk to somebody, oh, yeah, hell sounds like, sounds like a better place. I'll play pool all, all day. But you know what? That, that shows a, a lack of understanding of what hell is going to be like. It is a terrible place. You will not be playing pool with your friends. And we should do whatever it takes to avoid being sent there. And many, now many people, I've talked to people about this, and they say, but, but God will forgive me because I'm sorry and I've repented. Well, imagine you were caught speeding and were given a fine. You're standing before the judge and you say, well, judge, I'm sorry. I confess and I repent and I won't ever do it again. Well, will the judge still make you pay the fine? Of course he will. If he didn't, he'd be a crooked judge. The truth of the matter is that we have all broken God's law, and we owe a fine to God that we cannot pay. We mu he must and he will punish us. We can confess and repent all we want, but unless our fine is paid, we cannot be set free. If God set us free from hell without the fine being paid, he'd be a crooked judge. 
Now, some people say they don't believe in God and don't believe in hell and judgment. Yeah, that's uh, whatever. I don't believe in that. But whether we say we believe in God or not has nothing to do with the reality of whether or not he, God, exists and will judge us. Think of it this way. Imagine you were pulled over by a traffic policeman. What do you suppose would happen if you said, sir, I will not obey you. I don't even believe you exist. And you got back in your car and drove away. Well, here's what will happen. About a mile away, about a mile away you're going to have a, a roadblock of troopers with their revolvers uh, pointed uh, right at you. Uh, what would happen if you got out and said, men, put those revolvers down. I don't even believe they exist. I mean, it's futile. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you believe in it. It doesn't matter whether or not you like it. It doesn't matter whether or not you even think it's right. It's true. And you know because by listening to your conscience, you know it's true. The truth that God exists is not shaken if some people claim to be atheists or agnostics, whether we believe it or not, the serious truth of the matter is we have all broken God's law, and we are heading for the day of judgment, whether we believe it or not. But here is the great news. And this is the exciting part that I came to talk about. God came to earth as a man to pay the penalty for the law that we broke. Jesus Christ is God in human form. The Gospel of John said the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he never sinned once. Yet he died like a sinner to pay the penalty for our sins. That's why Jesus died like a thief, even though he wasn't a thief. That's why he was, he was brutally handled like a murderer, even though he was not a murderer. That's why he died, to pay the fine that we couldn't pay. Some of us think, oh, I'm a good person so God won't send me to hell. But we mistakenly think that our volunteer time in the soup kitchen or, or our tutoring of underprivileged youths or, or helping, under, you know, helping people across the street is going to impress God. But remember, God sees us as lying, thieving, blasphemous adulterers. So any good deeds that we offer are tantamount to trying to, to bribe God as if to say, it's okay, God, you know, here's my payment. But like a good judge, God does not accept bribes. In fact, you'll anger him more if you try to offer that. The Bible teaches in Isaiah that we are all like an unclean thing, and our righteousness are like filthy rags, Isaiah 64, 6. So if we try to offer to God good deeds, God sees those as filthy rags. Imagine a criminal being found guilty of murder and rape and saying to the judge, I know I'm guilty, but I want you to know I've done some good in my life too irrelevant. Only a crooked let judge would let that lawbreaker go. God is not a crooked judge. He will not overlook our crimes because of some good we may have done. The only way that our fine can be paid is for Jesus to pay it. It is his gift to us. Have you ever heard the gospel explained this way? Imagine that you're in a courtroom and you owe a fine and you can't pay it and someone you don't even know comes in and says, I love this person, I will pay the fine for him, and that's a picture of Jesus paying our fines. Anybody ever heard that, that illustration or, or some yeah. form of that? Right. That's not bad, but I'd like to suggest to you that it's not really accurate or biblical. It's more, here's, here's what's missing in that. It's true that we are in a courtroom and we owe a fine and someone comes in to pay our fine, and that's Jesus Christ, but he's not a stranger. He's actually somebody whose house we've broken into, we've spray-painted his car, and we've murdered his children. And yet he still pays the fine. The Bible says we are enemies of God through wicked works. That's God's grace. It's not just that he pays the fine for people, but he pays the fine for sinners who have spent their whole life in defiance of him, who have spray-painted his car, who have talked, badly about his name, who have lied, stolen, broken his laws, shaken their fists, and blasphemed his holy name, and he died for them. And as the Apostle Paul said, in some were such of you, some were such of us. But the good news, we were washed, we were justified in the blood of Jesus Christ. Friends, I'm here because I have great news for you. God saves sinners.
God saves sinners. Now, some people say that they believe in God and that they even believe in Jesus. But see, knowing in your mind, in your, having an intellectual knowledge of God and even Jesus, and even believing that you're a sinner will not save you. Jesus warned in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, what would you think of a person who jumped from a plane holding onto a parachute, believing the parachute would save him, but didn't put the parachute on? Such a person would be a fool. In the same way, lots of people say, oh, I believe in God. Oh, yeah, I believe I love Jesus. Oh, yeah, love Jesus. He's my homeboy. (laughs) But that doesn't do you any good unless you put Jesus on the way you would put on a parachute. The most important question anyone could ask is, how do we have our sins forgiven? The Bible says three things are essential. One, repent of your sins. Two, believe that Jesus paid your fines by dying on the cross and raising himself from the dead. And three, follow him as Lord. And because God is so kind and so merciful, he promises that he will forgive us 100%, all your blasphemy, all your hatred, all your murder, all everything. It's gone. It's taken from you. It is put on Jesus. He is punished for that, and you are seen white as snow if we will repent of our sins, put our faith in him, and follow him all our days. And why wouldn't we? What a great God. I gladly will follow such a person. Some of us follow uh, men. We follow, we follow our president. We follow uh, Tom Brady. We follow uh, who, who, Kurt Schilling, whoever. Pick your person, and we will follow them. But I want to say to you that nobody is worthy to follow except for Jesus Christ. He died on the cross. He took the wrath of God that we deserve, that was stored up. Every time you sin, the Bible says it's stored up in a bucket, and God took that bucket and poured it on the perfect one so that you, who hated him, could be set free. Praise God. And when we do that, the Bible says that you are a new creation, and you get to go to heaven not because you're a good person. You will not be in heaven because you're a good person. You will go to heaven because you are a bad person who was forgiven by a very good God. No one in heaven will ever be able to boast that they earn their way there because none of us deserve it. It is the free gift of God. So God gets all the credit. God gets all the glory. God has so much mercy to give us but we must repent of our sins, believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead to pay our fine and follow him as Lord. Now, repent is an old-fashioned word that's not looked upon too kindly today, but the Bible says we must repent in order for Jesus to pay our fine. Repent means to turn from your sin. Stop justifying yourself with, oh, I'm not such a bad person or others are much worse than me. Or God doesn't really care that I sleep with my girlfriend. Or all God cares about is you have a good heart. And that's, that's really all God cares. No, repent means you turn away from that thinking. And you turn from your, st- your sin the way you would turn from a foul stench. We must repent. The Bible warns us that God commands all people everywhere to repent. because he Why? Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. Apostle Paul said that, Acts 17, 30, 31. God will see to it that justice is served. The great news is that Jesus offers to pay your fine when you repent, believe, and follow him. Your badness will go on him. And get this, his goodness will go on you. That's atonement. You'll still be guilty of your crimes, but your fine will be paid and justice will be met. And God will not be crooked to let you go. Instead of getting what you deserve, eternity in hell, you will get what you don't deserve, heaven, with the God who paid your penalty for you. What a wonderful and kind and merciful Savior. That's why I came here today. I wouldn't come here to come talk about the New England Patriots as much as I like them. I wouldn't come here to talk about computer networking. I wouldn't get up early to do that. But I will get up early and drive anywhere to talk about the God who came from heaven to pay for sinners by taking the wrath of God upon himself. Hallelujah. All our sins can be forgiven. All of it. We will face God on Judgment Day, and we've all violated God's laws. We deserve hell. 
The great news is that Jesus, the only one who never sinned even once, died on a cross to pay a debt he didn't owe so that we can be set free from a debt we cannot pay. That knowledge ought to break our hearts and make us love and appreciate him so much. I know people come to me and say, Mark, you know, oh, you're trying to be good, you, you know, to, to impress God, try to go to heaven, you know. Even my old parents will say, you know, oh, you're trying to be good. No, 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 I'm not trying to be good to impress God. I try to be good because I love God. I love God. Just like, you know, you're, you're not kind to your spouse in order so that your spouse will marry you. You're already married, and that's why you're kind to your spouse, because you love them. And so don't get me wrong, good works are a part of the Christian life, but they come after as, as, as an act of worship, as a sacrifice, because you're so, so thankful to this wonderful God that you can't help but do good things because you want to pl please him and, and praise his name. So please, I beg you, I am drawing to a close, believe it or not, uh, I beg you, Please receive Jesus as Lord. You, can, you have a choice. You can stand before God based on your own works and be condemned, or you can stand before God based on Jesus' works and be saved. And please do it today because you might not have tomorrow. Ten out of ten people die. No one is exempt from that. Please obey God's command to repent. The God of the universe told you you must repent and receive the gospel. Follow him as Lord. <laughs> Please find a Bible and read the Gospel of John. Reginald said that, they, that there are some Bibles available here. Um, read it. Consider what it has to say. There's nothing more important than this. I want to thank you for your time and your attention. I want to thank you for your hospitality. Um, but just before I do go, I just want to say that if you have come to realize that nothing you can do will earn you a place in heaven and you have trusted completely in Jesus, to save you, then God considers you a new creation. You are, in fact, and I don't, I don't mean this uh, condescendingly, but I mean this as a very nice thing, you are a baby Christian. And just like real babies need milk to thrive and grow, so do baby Christians need milk to thrive and grow. And milk for a, for a Christian is the word of God. So please, you will grow spiritually if you read God's word every day and obey what you read. Also, please attend a church that teaches the true message of salvation as found in the Bible. And uh, I want to thank you uh, very much. Uh, and before I leave, I do have two gifts for you if you want. Um, a, a number of people often, they'll ask me for a, a written copy of my testimony, and I have many copies. It's called A Jew and His God. And it's, I had to put it on uh, 11 by 14 because I'm long-winded and it wouldn't fit on the uh, uh, 8 and a half by 11. So uh, it had to go on the 8 and a half by 14 but I have copies up here. You're welcome to take a copy. And I also have a, a, a page, Resources to Help uh, Jewish People with the Gospel of Jesus Christ. If you want uh, some suggestions for reaching Jewish people or anybody with the Gospel of Jesus Christ, I put together some resources. I think all of them are free, um, and you're welcome to take that. And just thank you so much. Uh, I enjoyed this very much, and it was a privilege. And uh, thank you. God bless.